Okay. So hopefully everybody saw the email last night. If you didn't, two quick announcements. Number one, if you haven't filled out the course survey yet, please do so. I mean, I suppose it's not essential, but if you want to have any input on when we hold our office hours, when we hold the discussion section, what topics we cover in the class, then fill out the survey. Also, send around a doodle poll. I choose a time for the discussion section. If you plan to attend the discussion section at all, go on there and indicate what time's best. We'll try to find a time that works for everybody. And if you plan to attend it, like, on a weekly or nearly weekly basis, as opposed to only when you have questions, then indicate that on the survey or send an email and let us know, and we'll give you higher priority if we can't find a time that works for everyone. So today I'm going to discuss experimental design in a little more detail. That First we'll discuss blocking, which is often quite useful in the bench science world, although it's a fairly short topic and also can discuss some basics of sampling. I mean, the Bio 600 sister course to this class devotes like three or four lectures to sampling. To me, that's overkill because it's something, it's probably of less interest in the bench science world, but I still feel like I should at least give you the basics behind it, if no other reason, so that when you read studies in the literature, you can be able to evaluate whether their sampling was done correctly or not, but it's not something that I'm going to emphasize heavily in this course. So, recall from the last two lectures that when you design an experiment, you, the ideal design is the treatment in the group and the control group should be as similar as possible, with the obvious exception of the treatment itself. And if the treatment group and the control group have any sort of systematic differences other than the effect of the treatment, then there's a potential for confounding. This is why controlled experiments are usually preferable to observational data, because with, ob with observational data, almost inevitably, there will be some dis differences between the treatment group and the control group that don't have anything to do with the treatment. So the best way to ensure that the two groups are comparable is randomization, where you just randomly assign half to the treatment group, half to the control group, to, and that way the probability that there will be any systematic differences between the treatment group and the control group becomes very small, assuming your sample size is reasonably large. Now, that last caveat that I just gave you is an important one, that it work, this completely randomized design works well when you have a large number of subjects. When in the SALT vaccine trial, for instance, we had a sample size in the orders of tens of thousands. So when you compare the tree children who got the vaccine to the children who got the placebo, the probability that there's going to be more boys than girls in one group than the other is virtually zero. You would have to be absurdly unlucky for that to happen. But if, say, you're doing an experiment in your lab and you only have 10 mice, then the probability that your five male mice end up in the treatment group and five female mice end up in the control group, still relatively small, is no longer negligible. So if you have a smaller study like that, then there's a non-negligible danger that your randomized groups are not comparable that you could end up with systematic differences between treatment group and control group other than the treatment itself. And if you know in advance that potential confounding variables might exist, you can ameliorate this problem using a technique known as blocking. Oh, a simple example of when blocking might be useful was an experiment on the growth of turkeys that the experimenter wanted to know if you could add methionine to the diet of turkeys to, to help them grow larger, presumably for commercial purposes. And 
In this case, apparently it was already known that methionine would increase growth. The goal of the experiment was to compare three different types of methionine, which we'll call T1, T2, and T3. So the experimental design was that they would collect 12 turkeys, randomly assign four of them to get T1, four to get T2, four to get T3. Three weeks later, they would weigh them and see which group of turkeys was the heaviest. And in this experiment, uh, the confounding variable was the location of the cage. The place where the turkeys were kept was in a series of cages that was four layers high that they had three cages on the floor and then three cages stacked on top of those and three cages on top of those and so on up to level four. And since hot air rises, cages closer to the ceiling were warmer than the cages closer to the floor, and it turns out that how much a turkey eats depends on the temperature of the surrounding air. So if you got unlucky and say, like, oh, all turkeys assigned to the T1 group were towards the bottom of the stack, then the effect of treatment would be confounded with the effect of temperature. I mean, that's unlikely to happen in a purely randomized design, but it's possible, and you can avoid this problem using blocking, as I'll discuss here in a minute. So, the idea behind blocking is extremely simple, so simple that you might be thinking it's an insult to your intelligence that I even have to bring this up, but... Just so you're familiar with the terminology, if nothing else, the idea behind blocking is that if you know if there's some sort of confounding variable in your experiment, it could be, in this case, it's the height of the cage the turkey's kept in. If you were doing an experiment on mice, it might be the gender of the mice or the litter that the mice came from, something like that. Base one way or another, the idea behind blocking is you find this confounding variable, then within each level of the confounding variable, you create a block, basically partition it into homogeneous subgroups. In the turkey example, you take the cages on the floor to be one block, cages on level two to be a block, cages on level three to be a block, and so on. And then you do your randomization within each block rather than just randomizing the entire data set. And yeah, basically said most of this already. The idea is that the idea behind blocking is to try to identify subgroups of your experimental units, then you randomly assign the treatment or treatments within each block. And the important thing when you do this blocking is you want your blocks to be as homogeneous as possible. That in the turkey example, it would, you would just be looking at cages. In a more complicated example, you might want to consider like the gender of the turkeys or like experiment with mice, the gender of the mice, what letter they came from, the strain of the mice. Any sort of variation you would want to eliminate by putting it within the same block, and all this extraneous variation should occur between blocks rather than within blocks. Oh, the advantages of blocking is the major one is it avoids confounding, that it avoids the possibility that you see differences in the effectiveness of the turkey treatments due to the height of the cage. It avoids the possibility that you see systematic differences in your mice due to gender or strain or whatever the case may be. And I mean, if you haven't gotten anything out of these last couple lectures, it's that when you do science, confounding is a very serious problem one of the single biggest reasons that you can get incorrect results in science. So you want to do everything you can to eliminate confounding. Blocking is one of the single most effective ways to do it. So at the point where you can do blocking, it's something that you should strongly consider.
And another advantage of blocking that's a little bit more subtle that I won't discuss in as much detail, but it reduces the variance in your summary statistics. That you can show, if you go through the math, which I won't, that, say, for instance, if you want to calculate the mean weight of the turkeys, if you make sure that you put... Well, the turkeys is a bad example because you probably only have one subject in each block. But, say, let's say that you have, like, ten mice from five, each, each from five different strains, and you calculate the mean of each strain separately, and then average across all blocks to find the overall mean, that that estimate will have lower variance than if you just mindlessly threw all the numbers it together to calculate the mean. But, and like I said, you'll just have to take my word for it on that, but we'll discuss this in the case of matched pairs design a little bit later in the course, but otherwise I won't spend a lot of time on this. But when you do this, the important thing is your blocks have to be homogeneous. If your blocks are not homogeneous, you can actually make things worse and increase your variance rather than decrease it. So, turkey example, I mean, I guess I've already basically described this, but as I said before, since the height of the cage is the major confounding variable, you will just take each row of cages as a block, the three cages on the floor are one block, the three cages on the second row are a block, three cages on the third row are a block, and within each block you randomly assign one turkey to get T1, one to get T2, and one to get T3. That way, um, that way it ensures that you'll have exactly one turkey getting each treatment at each height, which should eliminate the confounding effect of temperature when you compare the three groups. And another example of blocking was an experiment that was con conducted trying to see how experience affects the anatomy of the brain in mice that young, or in rats rather, they placed young rats in one of three different environments for a period of 80 days and wanted to see how it affected the growth of their brain. Group one was a standard environment where you get a regular cage with one other rat. Group two was an enriched environment where they got a cage with several different friends and a bunch of toys. And group three was an impoverished environment where the rat was by itself and wanted to see if there was any sort of difference between these three groups. And after 80 days, they measured the size of the rat's brain, various other anatomical measurements, and we want to try to set up this experiment to minimize the potential sources of bias slash confounding. So, the way they set us up is they had 30 rats available to do, this ex to do this experiment. First of all, they saw that gender and strain are both potential confounding variables. They just limited those, those straight off the bat. They said, we're only going to use male mice in this experiment and they're all going to be from the same strain, so variation due to gender and strain will be eliminated. But it could go a step further that rats from the same litter are more likely to be similar than rats from different litters. So the way they set it up is they took 10 different litters from each litter. They took three male rats, and each litter each set of three rats from a letter for a block, at which point you randomly assigned one to treatment one, one to treatment two, and one to treatment three, thereby uh, avoiding the potential effect of letter when analyzing these results. And another way that you can do blocking is within subject blocking, 
that basically you can collect duplicate measurements on the same subject. This is what's called matched pairs design, or an example of matched pairs design, which is a really common design approach across a variety of experiments. Later in the course, we'll discuss some special methods for analyzing this type of data that can give you better results in some circumstances. But in this experiment, there's a dermatologist who wants to compare two oceans for treating acne. She has a total of 20 patients for her study, and she wants to try to get the minimum amount of bias and maximize the amount of useful information from the study. So how can one go about designing this experiment? And one way that you could go about this experiment that actually is not horrible, but is suboptimal, that basically the simplest approach to say, okay, we'll randomly split these 10 people in half, we'll sign half to receive lotion A, the other half to receive lotion B. And I mean, that's a defensible design and most likely will not give terrible results. But it does have certain drawbacks that the amount of acne varies quite drastically from person to person and you could get unlucky and the people who have really bad acne all end up in the treatment group which would which would create bias against the treatment or they could all end up in the control group creating bias in favor of the treatment or something like that. So there's a potential for bias or confounding here. You could also have bias due to gender or age or any number of other factors. Another drawback to this approach is that it reduces the sample size somewhat needlessly. It means you only have 10 in the treatment group and 10 in the control group which again, I mean, isn't catastrophic, but there's an alternative design that is somewhat more efficient. The better design is you just do within subject blocking. To each subject in the study, you tell them to use lotion A on one half of their face and lotion B on the other half. And the side of the face that gets the treatment lotion is chosen randomly and when they're administered the bottles just have coded labels so neither the patient nor the physician knows which lotion is on which half of the face. So there's a double blind element going on here. And that has several advantages. First of all, it mostly eliminates the subject-to-subject -subject variability that if the if it doesn't matter if a person has very little acne or very severe acne they're exposed to both the treatment group and the control group so I mean unless for some bizarre reason the acne is more likely to happen on one side of the face than the other that should eliminate this potential source of confounding and another advantage is it increases your sample size that rather than having 10 K 10 in the treatment group and 10 in the control group you now have 20 in the treatment group and 20 in the control group so this design is it tends to be more efficient than the more naive design where you just assign half to one treatment and half to the other treatment. Another case where you may want to use blocking is say you're running a microarray experiment where you want to compare gene expression <clears throat> on two different cell lines come exposed to two different treatments and you know in advance that these two cell lines have different gene expression profiles and as I noted a couple lectures ago in microarrays that dye bias is another potential source of confounding that certain genes hybridize better with red dye than with green dye or vice versa and if you don't adjust for that effect then there's a a danger that the effect of the treatment could be confounded by the effect of the dye. So the probably the simplest design that to get around these problems is you just create four blocks. A block 
according to the levels of both the dye and cell line. So cell line 1 red, cell line 1 green, cell line 2 red, cell line 2 green. And you end up with four blocks, and then within each block you assign half to receive treatment 1 and half to receive treatment 2. So that will allow you to see the effect of treatment on gene expression and control for both cell line bias and dye bias, and hopefully your final results won't be confounded by either the cell line or the dye. Oh, the things to remember about blocking is that blocking can reduce the bias in your study and the potential for confounding. It's also more efficient in the sense that it can reduce the variance in your study, but it only works if the blocks are homogeneous. If you have heterogeneous blocks, you can actually make things worse. And blocking it isn't a substitute for randomization. Basically, you just randomize within each block rather than randomizing the whole thing. One textbook said just basically you block what you can and control and randomize what you can't control. Any questions about blocking before I move to the second half of the discussion on sampling? Okay. So now brief discussion of sampling. As I said, a lot of this stuff is probably less relevant if you're mainly doing experiments in the lab, but it's still good stuff to know about. Just like I say, as much from a scientific literacy standpoint as anything, but it's not something that I'm going to emphasize as much. That when you do sampling, generally speaking, you can't study an entire population of interest, so you have to just take a sample of that population. And as I've screamed about for the past couple lectures, that if the, in order to draw valid inferences about the population as a whole based on a sample, you need to use good sampling methods such that to try to ensure that your sample is representative of the overall population. So first of all, some terminology that population is the group of individuals that you would like to know about that is generally quite broad. Say you want to do a study on risk factors for diabetes, for example. So your population of interest is the everyone in the world, or at least everyone in the U.S. who has diabetes. That's go generally going to be a really large population that there's no way that you can sample from in any sort of reasonable matter, not without an absurdly large budget. So generally speaking, you don't even attempt to sample from this overall population. A target population is a group that we want to obtain our information from, which is generally much more specific that you can sample from more easily. So, for example, you might say that your target population is the people who came to the diabetes clinic at UNC between 2009 and 2011 or something like that. And sampling from the smaller target population is more feasible. And generally speaking, you just have to hope that this target population is reasonably representative of the overall population. I mean, more often than not, it won't be perfectly representative, but you hope that at least some of the findings from your target population will generalize to the overall population. Then your survey population is subjects in the target population that you can potentially obtain information from. That if your target population is everybody who came to the UNC Diabetes Center between 2009 and 2011, well, some of these people, with, you won't have phone numbers or their addresses will be incorrect or whatever the case may be. 
or some may refuse to participate in your studies, so they don't make it into your survey population. Survey population is smaller group still, and you hope the survey population is representative of the target population, which is representative of the overall population. As I say, generally each step of this chain, you're not going to get perfect representation. We saw in the SALT vaccine trial that the group of people or the group of children whose parents refused treatment, refused to participate in the vaccine trial, tended to have lower rates of polio than those who gave consent. That would be a case where the survey population is not perfectly representative of the target population. But you hope that it's close enough to being representative that your results are still valid. In the SALT vaccine trial, the effect of the vaccine was so large that we saw the effect and it generalized the population as a whole, despite the fact that it wasn't perfectly representative. So, generally speaking, when you define a target population, you need to define it very specifically. You need to define a unit that is a group of people, a set of clinics where you collect these people, a specific set of cell lines you're extracting cells from, the location where you're collecting this data, and the time that the data was collected. So, like, the specimens that were processed in the lab during the month of January, patients who got treated before the end of the year, etc. And as I alluded to earlier, generally speaking, there will be some slight differences between your target population and your survey population, and the two ways you can get differences is non-response and under coverage, which are slightly different. Non-response is that, like, you have a way to measure something, but you can't for whatever reason, that you have a phone number for the person, but they refuse to enter your study, or you have a sample from that particular cell line, but your genotyping assay failed quality control measures or whatever the case may be so that you end up not taking the measurement. And under coverage is when you simply don't have the ability to measure that particular experimental unit. That a person doesn't have a telephone so that you can't, you can't get in touch with them in the first place or the freezer died on a particular set of cell lines and all the DNA went bad, whatever the case may be. It means you don't even have the ability to measure some subset of your target population. And you hope that the bias introduced by non-response and under coverage isn't so severe that it has a major effect on your conclusions. And an example of like a target population slash survey population that I'll be discussing in a bit more detail on Friday was the study of childhood obesity in Australia that basically the goal of this study was to evaluate the relationship between childhood obesity and quality of life among elementary school children in Australia. So the overall population of interest was all elementary school children in Australia. Once again, sampling from that large population isn't going to be feasible, so they had to choose a target population they hoped is representative of Australia as a whole. The target population was all children in grades 3 through 6 in Victorian Australia in at the beginning of the school year in 2000 who had participated in another study in 1997. And presumably this was done for convenience purposes that these children who had participated in the 1997 study, they already had contact information and basic data on these children so they could be contacted fairly quickly and cheaply. 
are they representative of all elementary school children in Australia? Well, probably not perfectly, but you hope that any sort of systematic bias isn't so bad that it completely messes up your results. I mean, I don't know enough about the demographics of Australia to comment on this, but, I mean, these are the sorts of things that you need to think about that, say, for instance, if you did a comparable survey in the U.S. that had the consisted of children age 3 to 6 in, say, for instance, Greenwich, Connecticut, well, that may not be representative of children in age grades 3 through 6 in Harlem or Appalachia or something like that. So, when you define the target population, oftentimes cost is going to be one of the defining factors, but you need to think, how representative is this likely to be of the population as a whole? And if there's some reason why it's not, again, I mean, you don't throw up your hands and give up. This is the sort of thing you write about in the discussion section that, okay, we only had the money to evaluate this in Greenwich, Connecticut. The generalizability to, of this study to places that don't consist of rich white people is questionable. Further research needs to be done is the standard way that you would get around it. And the survey population in this particular case would be members of the target population from whom we can collect data. Anyone who moved away wouldn't make it into the survey population, or anyone who refused to fill out a survey wouldn't make it in the study. In this childhood obesity study, hopefully the survey population is very close to the target population. There won't be a huge number that moved. And if they participated in the earlier study, they're not likely to refuse the second one. But you will lose some that way, and you hope that it's fairly representative of the overall population. I mean, sometimes you can try to show this directly. I'm working on a major study right now on temporomandibular disorder, where basically we tried to do a prospective study. We recruited some 3,000 people, asked them to fill out a questionnaire every three months to see if they develop TMD. Well, about 20% of our sample never filled out this follow-up questionnaire. Oh, I raised the question, are the people from whom we collected data representative of our overall study? And basically we found the, was it perfectly representative? No. The set of people who filled out the follow-up questionnaires tended to be more educated, more white, more female than our overall population. But the differences weren't huge. So basically that's the same sort of thing. When, as we write our paper on this, we're just saying, okay, look, we know this is not perfectly representative. Here's the possible sources of bias. But given that we're pretty close to the larger population, hopefully the bias is small. Oh, then moving onward in terms of terminology, a definition of a sample is uh, the part of the population from which you draw the data, which would be the subset of your survey population. That in this childhood obesity study, you randomly select some of these children to fill out the survey, or other examples if you have a company with 2,500 people, you could randomly select 130 of them to fill out a questionnaire on workplace safety, or I mean, just if you're cooking, you s take out a couple, s you have a bite or two to see if it's spicy enough and hope that it's representative of the entire pot. Um, as I'll discuss through the rest of today, the when you do this type of sampling, the best way to do the sampling is what's called probability sampling, sometimes known as random sampling, which means that basically every member of the population 
has a non-zero probability of being selected, and then you just select at random according to these probabilities. In the most simple cases, you just give equal probability to every single to every single experimental unit in your survey population. That for the childhood obesity survey, you just give a number to every single child in your survey population, draw a certain number of numbers out of a hat, that's your survey population. As I'll discuss on Friday, you won't always want to use a design that simple that particularly if there's heterogeneity in your data set, you can sometimes do better by giving greater weight to certain subgroups, like for instance, when they did polls for the presidential election last year, political polls in general, they want a sample that's representative of the U.S. population as a whole, so they may try to like oversample African Americans or Hispanics, minority groups that you won't necessarily get enough of if you just do a simple if you just do an equal probability sample within your target population. I'll discuss this in more detail on Friday, but the point is that you come up with some probability that of choosing any given experimental unit and you choose which ones go in your, in your sample randomly as opposed to using some other criteria. And non-probability samples or non-random samples that get used sometimes are include the following include the stuff on the following slides, anecdotal evidence, where you just choose special cases because they were unusual or interesting, or the data collector chooses the items to include in the sample that some people may be easier to contact, or they may just randomly choose the first three names in the phone book, or whatever the case may be. You may have some expert try to come up with a list of experimental units that they deem to be quote-unquote typical, or you could have a voluntary response sample, which is like an online internet poll where people decide whether or not they want to fill it out. And as I will discuss here in a moment, non-probability samples are generally bad because experience has shown that they can be horribly non-representative of the population even when the sample size is very large. Oh, to give a couple famous examples of disasters related to non-random sampling, I think I mentioned this example briefly last Wednesday, but one of the most famous cases where non-random sampling went horribly wrong was in 1936, there was a magazine called the Literary Digest, which apparently at that point in time was like a huge deal. I mean, it was something like Time Magazine, something with a really large l readership, and it surveyed 2.4 million of its subscribers, which is one of, which at the time was the largest opinion poll ever conducted. I believe it's still one of the largest opinion polls ever conducted in history, and they predicted that Alf Landon would defeat FDR in a landslide, which if you know anything about history, that did not happen, did not come anywhere close. And the reason this happened is because the Digest surveyed, number one, the people who subscribed to their magazine, and also people who had cars and telephones and things like that. And that was grossly non-representative of the population in the Depression-era U.S. If you had enough extra money to subscribe to magazine or to own a car or a phone, you were much wealthier than the overall population. So, despite the enormous sample size, it was an extremely non-representative sample. It was much wealthier than the overall population.
as a result, it grossly overstated the support for Landon, and Literary Digest ended up going out of business shortly after this, partly because their survey went so horribly wrong. Another famous example of when opinion polls got it grossly wrong due to bad, due at least partially to bad sampling methods. If you've never seen this headline before, it was the presidential election, I uh, forget what year, in the 1950s, that every single poll that had been conducted indicated that Thomas Dewey was going to easily beat Harry Truman to the point that the Chicago Tribune just assumed that it was a done deal that Dewey would defeat Truman in the election and ran this headline, here's Harry Truman holding up the, a copy of this paper after he won re-election just because he just thought the whole thing was hilarious. Oh, by that time, people had learned from the Literary Digest thing that simply surveying people who have telephones or subscribe to expensive periodicals will give you biased results. How did they get it wrong again? Well, in 1948 election, okay, I obviously didn't remember that right, but 1948 election, most pollsters used a method called quota sampling which was basically they were trying to make sure there were a certain number of women, a certain number of lower income people, a certain number of African Americans in their studies. Like, hey, we don't only want rich white people in our study, we want poorer people, we want African Americans, etc. But as long as the surveyors met their quota for the number of women, the number of minorities, or whatever the case may be, they could interview anyone who they wanted. So it was still non-random. It wasn't like you chose a specific survey population and drew randomly from that population. It was you could choose anyone you want as long as you met your quota. And once again, the interviewers tended to interview wealthier respondents more often than not, because in that day and age, it was still mostly the wealthy who had telephones and things like that, so they tended to be easier to contact, which created bias in Dewey's favor. In fact, there's been some analysis conducted that through the entire time that this quota sampling was used, there was systematic bias towards the Republicans in almost all the polls that were conducted because they said the quota sampling method, you tend to get people who are wealthier than the overall population. And you tend to get people who are wealthier than the overall population who tended to be more Republican. And even these methods aren't as bad as like online polls that are completely voluntary response. I mean, there's a reason that on TV they always put a disclaimer up that these polls are non-scientific because, generally speaking, the only people who bother to go and vote on an internet poll are the people who have strong opinions about it who tend to be grossly non-representative of the population as a whole. It's, I mean, that's how you get, like, these online surveys saying that, like, 90% of the U.S. public opposes any sort of further gun control sort of thing. It's like the NRA spams their entire mailing list, say, go vote in this online poll and nobody else bothers. Oh, well, of course you get 90% against it sort of thing. So, hopefully this makes the point on why non-random samples should be avoided, that they can be very highly biased. And if your sample is biased, it does not matter how large your sample size is, your results will still be invalid. In any type of statistical analysis, you are much, much better off with a small sample size that's representative of the population than a large sample size that's biased. The Literary Digest had 2.4 million people in its sample and still got the presidential election completely wrong. Nowadays, the polling methods have improved. People who do presidential election polls usually only interview a couple hundred people, 
and in most recent election, they nailed it almost exactly. So you can do much better with a representative sample of a few hundred than a non-representative sample of millions. And the, hence the reason for using probability sampling, random sampling, is it should at least in theory eliminate sampling bias since everybody has equal probability of being selected or has equal probability along some criteria, you can eliminate the bias that wealthier people are more likely to end up in your sample, and you can also get a handle on your sampling variability. I'll discuss later in this course that people have worked out mathematically how much variability you expect to see in a sample of a given size, which you can then estimate. That's how they estimate the margin of error in these presidential election surveys, because people know the formula for that. But you cannot completely eliminate your sampling variability unless you want to survey your entire population. The one drawback to probability sampling is that it's more expensive, but you know, whatever. It's like better to spend some extra money and get correct results than to spend less money and get complete garbage results. And as I noted on the previous slide, any type of sample, there's going to be sampling variability. If one pollster surveys 300 people, asks who's, who they're going to elect president, another pollster interviews 300 different, 300 different people and asks them who they're, they're going to elect for president, you're going to see some slight differences from sample to sample. That's sampling variability. And in general, the variability goes down as your sample size increases, but it won't go to zero until you survey the entire population. And when you do random sampling, there's formulas to calculate this variability, and you can even estimate what sample size you need to get an acceptable level of variability. And you can get two types of error when you do this survey sampling. That sampling error is error that results from the fact that you're not sampling the entire population. I said that's the sampling variability that I just discussed, that you interview 300 different people, get a slightly different estimate of, for Obama's approval rating, whatever the case may be. Non-sampling error is other types of error not related to sampling that you, there's errors in your measurement, that people lie when they fill out your survey, whatever the case may be. And random sampling can't overcome non, random sampling can't overcome non-sampling error, that is measurement errors, wording the question badly, people who don't fill out your survey or refuse to fill it out, or anything like that. And I rambled on too long today. We're almost out of time. I'll try to wrap this up quickly. That measurement error is when you measure something wrong, your equipment doesn't work, your interviewers don't know what they're doing, processing error is your computer doesn't work, there's something physically wrong with your data, it was scanned incorrectly, whatever the case may be. And also the wording of your question can have a big effect on your survey that if the, some terms can elicit a strong response or sometimes people won't understand what your question means, and we're out of time. It's a great story, so I'm going to tell it quickly anyway. I have a collaborator who's an OBGYN who was in the ER who once asked a woman who came in for emergency surgery if she was sexually active, and this woman said no. And then just as a matter of routine, she did a pregnancy test and found out this woman was pregnant. She was, like, terrified to tell this woman I, something horrible happened. Somehow you got pregnant anyway. She's like, oh, okay, no big deal. It's like, well, I thought you said you weren't sexually active. And this woman was like, 
Oh, I thought sexually active meant like you're doing it all the time, like three or four times per day or something. I mean, I have sex occasionally. It's not surprising I'm pregnant. I mean, somebody who's never heard that term before could be confused by it. So you have to make sure that you word the question such that it's non-confusing. So anyway, non-response under coverage. I won't belabor this point anymore, but people who can't be contacted or who can be contacted but refuse to participate. So basically, when you do sampling, if you can't examine an entire population, you do a sample. Random samples are the best, and you want to avoid, mi avoid slash minimize these various sources of error when sampling. Any questions about anything today? Well then, one last plug for the course survey and the doodle poll. I'm hoping to try to find a time for the discussion section, hopefully our office hours by the end of the week or early next week.